Good evening, everyone. We have this last session, which is Fall Feast Part 2. And we've had some really amazing insights going into the first uh, season of the Feast, the Spring Feast, and then now the last session we covered the Fall Feast. This is the second part of the Fall Feast. And we will be covering today the Feast of Sukkot, which is Feast of Tabernacles, and Shemini Atzeret, which is the eighth day. Sukkot is a seven-day holiday or seven-day feast, and Shemini Atzeret is the is an eighth is the eighth day. It's a separate one, so we'll go over that more. We're going to open with a quote one last time. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, "The fifteenth day of the seventh month." shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. That's Leviticus 23, 34-36. And the one who said that directly was the Lord. So there are our quotes. So on the overview, we covered parts of creation. We covered seven things that he sets apart. We covered the overview of all the feasts from Passover to, the, to uh, Shavuot Feast of Weeks and then the Fall Feast, we did cover all that. The feasts are designed to prepare us for marriage to our Messiah. That's the whole point of this, uh, the feast season. It's a timeline that's given to us that he provided to mankind so that we know what time we're in and what he wants from us in our hearts, preparing us as a bride. Also, we introduced the kingdom approach, which is how, we, we, uh, how this course has been laid out, that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I believe from Romans 14, 17, it really just starts describing the framework of his kingdom and his heart and allowing us to dwell in righteousness, peace, and joy, which we um, see here from, from the slides. Righteousness being the written word, peace being spiritual warfare, and joy being the regathering of Israel. All of the houses, the northern house, Ephraim, and the southern house, Judah, as it's prophesied in many places in the, in the scriptures. Primarily, Jeremiah 31 is what most uh, recall. So on our spring feast, part one, we covered Passover, first fruits, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In the spring feast, part two, we covered the counting of the Omer, which is what you have to do leading up to Shavuot, which is seven weeks of counting and Shavuot being the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. And the last session, Fall Feast Part 1, we covered Yom Teruah, which is a day of shouting or trumpets, and Yom Kippurim, which is a day of covering or a day of atonement. So this concludes, this session will conclude the three pilgrimage feasts. And where we find that is going to be in Deuteronomy 16, is where there's a summary. And it says three times a year, you, uh, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, which today is Jerusalem, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Sukkot, Tabernacles. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing the Lord your God has given you. So there's three times a year these are pilgrimage feasts. The others do not require travel. And there are other parts in the scriptures that says that the journey is too far from you, you can use the resources you would to go to Jerusalem and throw a big party. So you are commanded to party, uh, especially this last one, and to rejoice and to feed those around you and to invite and welcome others in. So it's definitely uh, the Feast of Sukkot especially is a feast of joy or rejoicing. So we'll get right into the Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, there shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you see the image there is a tabernacle. It's kind of, a little, looks a little more traditional, um, but that's what you would see in Israel or other places that happen to put a temporary uh, shelter or you know, booth or tabernacle. Uh, it is customary to dwell uh, and sleep out there and eat and invite guests and this is what they have been doing for thousands of years. It's still done today in Israel. If you were to look in uh, research photos, uh, you can Google Feast of Tabernacles, Jerusalem especially, and you'll see these all over the city. 
And I had had the privilege of attending uh, a Feast of Tabernacles uh, in 2011, and it was very crowded. There was tabernacles everywhere, people from all over the world. And so it's still happening today, which is really exciting to see. So also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of, your, of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willow of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So that image is um, an image of the four species. I have labeled them for you. So the citrus-like fruit looks like a lemon. It's called an etrog. And uh, that is uh, referring to the fruit of beautiful trees. And then you've got the date palm, the lulav, which is in the center. And it just looks like a palm branch. It's, and then also on the, on, the, uh, on the top left, you've got the arva, which is the willow. And then the hadas, which is the myrtle, there on the right side. And you can actually still purchase these. I purchase them every year on, online and uh, during the feasts. And it's a fun thing to have, um, especially the children. They get, we see you read in the scriptures and then you have it come in. Uh, they are um, imported from Israel mostly. Uh, so when I order them, it takes a few weeks to get in here. So I'll be ordering mine probably around uh, late September and it takes a little while to get in. But it's just a, it's one of those things that uh, it says he wants us to rejoice with these four species. Doesn't really explain why, but it just, it's just something uh, of joy. Feast of Tabernacles continued here. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in a year. You sh it shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate in the seventh month. There you shall dwell in booths or tabernacles for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I am made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them, brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. And that concludes Leviticus 23. So we have gone through the entire chapter of Leviticus 23. If you want to have a, a review or a recap of all of the feasts, the entire chapter has got a summary there. And if you see the image, that is an image from modern day Israel. That's at the Wailing Wall, where you've got thousands of people of all different types of backgrounds, uh, mostly from a Jewish background. They're, they're, uh, they will bring their four species. You can kind of tell there. They, they've got them. They're waving them. And they've got all sorts of really beautiful prayers around the four species and also uh, prayers for the nations to come in and, and inviting um, guests. In Hebrew, the word is ushpizin, which means the guests. So that's what they, um, they pray for as well. So now we're going to get into the eighth day, which is attached, called Shemeni Atzeret. And that is on the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. We also read in the book of Numbers 29, on the eighth day, you shall have a sacred assembly and do no customary work. So again, there's a few places where it lists the eighth day, and this is the one feast. Unlike Sukkot, we just had an explanation. He wants us to remember that the Israelites, our ancestors, because those of us who are here, who you may not know or whether I have Jewish ancestry or not, we are the seed of Abraham, and those are Abraham's descendants. And so because we're in, in Messiah and we're in Yeshua, they're also, it's, it's a family. Uh, it's all part of a family. So he still wants us to remember this time. To, that we dwell, to, he had us dwell in these tabernacles for seven days, just like he did in the wilderness for 40 years. And Shemani had said it, it does not give an explanation of the meaning of it. It just says to observe it. However, the New Testament gives us a really big insight into the framework of why this pattern of seven was implemented and then the eighth. And later we'll get into the meaning of why this is. It, the meaning is uncovered in the New Testament. So we are gonna review a historical event from the book of Luke about Yeshua's birth. And some of you may be familiar with this historical event. Most of the world will celebrate the birth at a later time in the winter. Um, there, are, there is a significant event that happened in the winter, and I'll go over that. But the birth, historically, and I'll show you from the book of Luke, 
most likely occur during the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day. And there are a few reasons why I'm, I, I lean this way and, and I teach and I believe it. Uh, there are many that do, especially for the prophetic significance. So just in John chapter 1, there's a really big hint here. It says, The Word became flesh and did tabernacle among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of an only begotten of a Father, full of grace and truth. And so some translations don't have that word tabernacle. If you go to Young's Literal and some of the other older translations, the word tabernacle is in there. And it is from the Greek. The word tabernacle is there. So rather than reading Luke's chapter 1 and 2 verbatim, I thought I'd just give you the play-by-play -play highlights here, right? So we have Zacharias, who is the father of John the Baptist. He was a priest. He was assigned the division of Abijah. So this is a priestly schedule that all the priests had to go minister in the temple. You find this in Chronicles 24.10, where it says the, the division of Abiyah, that scheduled time, is the eighth, and that usually falls around the summertime. The beginning of it starts in the spring at Passover, and then the eighth is going to be around the summertime. So the service time of Abiyah ended in early summer, which is around the third Hebrew month, so here's the series of events. Zacharias finishes his, his time. And then in Luke 1, 24, 23 through 24, documents when Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, conceived John the Baptist. And then she hid for five months. That brings us to late fall, around November time. Okay. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, gives the account. It documents when the angel Gabriel reveals to Mary, who is a virgin, about her relative Elizabeth being pregnant in the sixth month of her pregnancy. So Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, and Mary also learns that she is going to conceive a child, Yeshua. And this brings us to about early winter, around, winter begins usually around the 20th, or when it, the winter solstice rather, so this, around the 20th of you know, December time is usually around there. So it is the announcement of the conception is going to be around the winter time. You follow me so far? And this is all from Luke chapters 1 and 2. So Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56, documents Mary's visit to Elizabeth's house. That was in the sixth month of her pregnancy. And then she returns to Nazareth. She's there for about three months. She returns back to Nazareth after three months, which is around Passover. So from the winter time, three months later, brings us to the spring feast of Passover. And that's where she returns to Nazareth. And then Elizabeth has John the Baptist. And we do see during that visit that the child was leaping for joy and also had the Spirit of God placed on him, which is really significant, right? So Luke, chap Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, documents the birth of Yeshua six months later from Passover. Uh, that time, six months later, brings us to the Feast of Tabernacles. Also, we still see that the shepherds are still in the fields during the fall feast. The shepherds would not be in the fields in the wintertime. Another pattern here, as we know, if he's born during the Feast of Tabernacles, it's a seven-day feast. The eighth day was significant because we hear in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, it says, When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yeshua, Jesus, the name given to, uh, by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So that was fulfilled. And that most likely would have been fulfilled on the eighth day of the feast. And where we get that, as it was uh, written in Leviticus 12, uh, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. And the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So that's where that pattern comes in. So you've got seven days, eighth day. It all kind of fits together. It seems also the pattern of the millennial reign and then getting into the eighth day, the eternity. That's where this is all leading up to. So the verses here, there are several occasions where the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned in the scriptures in the book of John chapter 7. On the last day of the great, uh, the great day of the feast, that's the seventh day of Sukkot is referring to. At the beginning of chapter 7, it does refer to the Feast of Tabernacles. If you, go, you can go back and read the entire chapter of John chapter 7. And so here we are in verse 37. It says, okay, the last day of Sukkot, 
Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua, Jesus, was not yet glorified. So that was only in part that he was revealing some scriptures that were prophesied. And what he was quoting was a collection of about 15 scriptures, as I counted. But just to narrow it down, we'll go to Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Another layer to the prophecy, Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who, for, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall, uh, shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So the living waters is also a Hebraism, a Hebrew idiom for running water, something that's alive and running, not stagnant. This seven day of Sukkot is currently today known as Hoshana Rabbah, that is also associated with water libation rituals. So here he is revealing to them that scripture being fulfilled about the living waters. This is another major prophecy that he is revealing to them about him being the Messiah. So he did it in many different ways. And for those who were learning the scriptures, got it. And for those who still were not sure, he left them plenty of evidence all throughout the, the Gospels as we, as we read. So we see as well in the future, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's from Zechariah 14, 16. We covered some of this in our last session. So here we are. Now, the king over all the earth, which we know Yeshua will, uh, will reign over all the earth one day, and he wants us to come for this feast. So this is the one feast that's mentioned that he wants all of the nations to come in, which is why it falls in line with all of the references to uh, inviting those and welcoming those and even the prodigal son returning home seems to give the same theme of, of those who are out, uh, out lost and without hope who can come in. This feast happens to be one of those feasts where he wants us to, to return to him. And uh, so we see also the Feast of Sukkot being prophetic, a prophetic significance of the seventh millennium. It appears to be a, a period of time where we're dwelling with him in booths. So now we're getting into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the words, uh, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. So here, we start seeing the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is, the, this is where it's all leading to for the Feast of Sukkot. And here is the table is set, and it's just an image there where you, know, you see all the tribes and all, all, the, um, all of his elect will be there and all of us who are believers in him as we believe. So now we're gonna look at Shemani Atzeret, the eighth day when he's on his throne. Okay, so he said in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And, he went, and anyone not found on the written in the book of life we, well, was cast into the lake of fire. So this is starting to get into more details on the eighth day of when he is 
judging all those and commencing the eighth millennium, eternity. We also see another major event. So Shemaniah said it in the eighth millennium, we see a major event of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I saw, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So that's the promise we have. And that's what we're getting ready for. And you see lots of details of referring to tabernacles, referring to a new city. We see that Jerusalem is the place where he put his name, where he wants us to go Still to this day, he wants us to go there. It pleases him to keep that appointed time. So if sometime in the future you feel led to do that, to go to Jerusalem during some of these appointed times, it is an absolute fantastic experience because it's still alive and active. It's still there. So more on the eighth millennium. And this is just a really beautiful summary here in Revelation 22. I, Yeshua, Jesus, did send my messenger to testify to you these things concerning the assemblies. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And he who is hearing, let him say, come. And he who is thirsting, let him come. And he who is willing, let him take the water of life freely. There he is revealing again to John what was revealed in John 7. Everything's come full circle. He did it, that's why the image is back with holding the water. It was all an image there of the water, the water of life, the running, the living waters. And so, when you have a chance in your studies, do a search on living waters and see how many times it comes up and how it really starts to tie in with the very name, the essence of our Creator, of our Heavenly Father, of His Son, and where this is all going. So this brings us to the topic of spiritual warfare during the feasts. And I'm going to submit to you some, um, some new ideas here. But more, more importantly, just kind of updating how so far in the course I presented, you know, five areas of sin, and I've got the last two here for seven. And so now that we've complete, we're going to be completing all areas of sin that um, as I've shared before. When I was in 2008, I was at a course at Being Health, uh, uh, Being Health, Thompson, Georgia. It's a healing and deliverance ministry. I was able to see a pattern of the feast. I, was, I believe I was spiritually shown uh, something that, that really uh, caught my attention. Uh, there were seven areas of, of sin that they, uh, principalities that they focused on to help people with deliverance through. And then I, when I was looking and I was praying about it, I saw that there was a pattern with the feasts as well. So for this whole course, I've been giving insights. And tonight I'm going to give a full picture of, of that. So as we know, on this slide here, we see the spiritual warfare during the feasts. And these are his appointed times. Our Heavenly Father has set this in motion. He wants us to keep it. It pleases him. But the adversary wants to come and distort, to kill, steal, and destroy, to distract, to make sure we're not together in the same room. One of the, one of the scriptures that associated with the Feast of Sukkot, for instance, Tabernacles, is Psalm 133, where it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That in itself is a miracle. Considering how many denominations we have, and how many countries, and how many languages, how many doctrines and belief systems. I believe they're up in the thousands as far as doctrines go. And for him to bring us all back together, for only the king of Israel is the one that will bring us back together. And during the millennial reign, the thousand years, it may take us about a thousand years to get it right. That's just my guess. I don't know that it's going to happen overnight, but... You know, um, well, I guess when he, when he arrives and he shows, he shows us how to live and he shows us what pleases him even more, we start seeing his heart. So these areas of sin keep us from him. 
It keeps us from being truly healed. It keeps us from each other. It's, it's these, these areas of sin, are, uh, the adversaries design this to affect the relationship with God, self, and others. That's it. Those, that's his threefold strategy. And if somehow he can turn you against yourself, turn you against others, and then turn you against your Heavenly Father, then he's already won. And some people have things right with, with the Almighty, but they've got a lot of fallouts with other people, right? It happens. You've got to make amends. You've got to work through things. And then there's just the relationship with oneself. A lot of times, it's just really that's where the battle is in the mind. What we think of ourselves, what we believe about ourselves. So, for instance, envy and jealousy. Envy, we know, it's simply it's the desire that we, to desire things we don't have and be consumed by it. Jealousy is, is being possessive of what we already have and thinking that we somehow are entitled to it. There's nothing worse than that spirit, that's, that, that entitlement that comes in. It's just a really nasty spirit, right? And even with children, toddlers, you don't have to teach them to be possessive of their toys, of their things. But yet somehow, we don't really seem to shake that behavior, even in adulthood. Well, we seem to be possessive of our material things or belief systems, right? You ever talk to somebody and they aren't quite open-minded? Well, that sometimes there's something there that's blocking it, and you just have to discern and keep them in prayer. And I think that if we're aware of these things, we may be able to prevent a lot of fallouts and, dis, and uh, disheartening things or misunderstandings among one another. Be, but, but make no mistake, both principalities are designed to get you to doubt your Heavenly Father, to doubt His provision for you, and to doubt that He will not grant you what, what your needs are, get you to trust in the worst case scenarios, the deep-rooted fears, and you know, to be quite honest with you guys, a uh, 24 hour news cycle doesn't really help. And being around those who are, are perhaps given into some of this uh, fear, anxiety, and stress and worst case scenarios also doesn't help. But if you're aware of these things, we're able to take them back to our Heavenly Father and be brought back to a place of peace and tranquility and rest. Because without that, and without really knowing his heart on these matters, this is where we start to fall into areas of sin and be ensnared by these areas of sin. I want to give some scriptural background, something historically, and a message here tonight that has to do with anti-Semitism. So for the, re for the majority of this course, I've been very open about things being biblical. I've been able to share with you the difference between what is done in the modern Jewish world what has been done throughout history, and how most of the time when we're associating or we're talking about the biblical feasts, they're regarded as Jewish holidays. But now we know these are biblical feasts for everybody, all those who are in Messiah, as well as our brother Judah. And so when I refer to our brother Judah, the majority of our brother Judah does not believe, as you know, as we do. But they are still family. They are still the seed of Abraham. They are descendants. They are still part of God's chosen people, and so are we. And so we've got a family matter here. This isn't about politics. And so when we see anti-Semitism in the world and we do nothing about it, we really have a responsibility to pray for our brother Judah and do what we can to stand up against anti-Semitism. It's a little challenging, I know, for some because it immediately people start thinking that it's political or that it's about the state of Israel or that it's about agreeing with things that are going on in the Middle East. It's not about that. I'd like to submit to you this is about family. It's really what it's about. The heart of the matter is about family. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we're getting back to the prophecies. There's a prophecy about Yeshua. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So that's how the chapter starts out. If you want to read all of chapter 11, it is a powerful, powerful chapter about what Messiah is, what his role is and who he is. It reveals more. Even before you get to Isaiah 53, it starts getting into some very important details on his, his nature and who he is. Then in verses 12 and 13, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off, 
Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. What this is talking about prophetically, I'll submit to you, is something very specific now, because there are some people that believe in this world, it's very sad, that the Jewish people in Israel are not really Jews. But clearly here in Isaiah 11 it says he's going to gather them for the four corners of the earth and he's going to bring them back to their own land. He's already done that. It was an absolute miracle that the Jewish people were able to, f to fight through so many different types of persecution, nearly burned in ovens, most of them who suffered uh, nearly entirely burned in ovens, I shall say, and those who were died a tragic death. The Holocaust was something that's, if, if you get time to really study it out and look at the atrocities done during the Holocaust, they survived all of that. They were able to, f the, the state of Israel is able to be formed. And here we are, uh, 71 years later, and the land is thriving. They've taken a wasteland. When they got there, it was a wasteland. Today, when you see photos, Google photos, you can look at what the land of Israel looks like today. It's unrecognizable compared to the early 1900s. I've seen it for myself. Fields that used to be barren are now thriving with agriculture, with fruit and grain, technology. So the God of Israel has blessed the Jewish people and still the land. The land itself is holy. You guys with me so far? The events that go on in the land, the politics, the mixture of people, because those who live in Israel aren't all Jewish. As you know, there are lots of other neighbors of different cultures and mixtures, and those who immigrated there, primarily those who were there beforehand with the Arabs and the Palestinians. So we see that there's a mixture of groups of people. But nevertheless, we have never, as all of the nations, been able to actually go and worship in that territory, in Jerusalem, if it was not for our brother Judah being given that custodian responsibility that, that was prophesied they would have. And here they have it. But unfortunately, we do have movements among believers who believe in Jesus or Yeshua that will say they're not really Jewish, they're Edomites, or they're, they're not authentic, and that they're imposters, and they shouldn't be there, and they don't support the state of Israel. When you hear of these things, take them back to the Word, take them back to Isaiah 11, show them in different parts where they are still our brother. And we should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem still to this day, and we should be praying for the state of Israel and not in a political way. You don't have to agree with the politics. I don't agree with all the politics, no more than I agree with all the politics of our own land. But we still pray for our leaders, as we still should pray for the leadership in Israel, as well as the religious, because there are a lot of relationships I will submit to you. There are relationships that are being restored among Orthodox Judah with Ephraim. And when the scriptures are referring to Ephraim, it is really a generic term for all of those who were scattered, the northern house who were scattered abroad, who are now called Gentiles. But then we see all the way in Ephesians, right, that they're no longer called Gentiles. They're part of the commonwealth of Israel. That's all of us. So that's, that's the wonderful thing about these prophecies, is that there's not going to be any of this envy. For many years, again, a lot of this strife and envy and jealousy that comes up against the Jewish people is because of the spirit that's, that's being revealed here, the spirit of envy. So we have a responsibility to stand up to this and to undo it. And when we are walking in sanctification, walking in wholeness, our brother Judah sees that in us, sees the true love of Messiah. As much as we want to bring the witness of what Yeshua, what Jesus has done for us in our life, salvation and freedom, they have their reasons why they don't believe. But I believe right now is the time to share how powerful and how abundant he is in our life. And if we really are truly walking in love, it's going to show. And I'll submit to you that I've been in the same room with those who have seen that and who have given a witness and who have recognized, those in Orthodox Judah have recognized a group of us who were in Israel at a conference, uh, B'nai Yosef Conf uh, Congress and Ariel Israel, March of 2018. There were those who recognized that we are Ephraim, that we are the, the brother that went like the prodigal son kind of. They don't read that story, but that's how the best way you can, you can attribute it. And there are those of us who don't look at the Jewish people with that contempt, with that envy, with that hatred. We, there are thousands of, of believers that are now going to the land for the feasts or for, for Bible tours. You know, even here at Rock City, there are people that have been to the land 
and they go and they, they, they are supportive of it and uh, do what they can to pray for, for, the, for the people in the land. So I encourage you to make it about family. And when you, when you encounter someone who is Jewish, who you know very well is not a believer in the way you believe, with, you know, how we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there's an opportunity to love and engage them. Because when they find out you've learned about the feasts and you're able to point to scriptures and bring honor in that way, I believe that will pave the way for a healthy dialogue where they can see the love of Messiah in you. So in James 3.16, I know a lot of people like to quote John 3.16. I like to also quote James 3.16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are. But wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Going back to that envy, envy towards Judah, Here's a warning that James is giving. Who was, who was James related to? Jesus. And he was related to our master, his half-brother. I think he'd know a little bit about the prophecies in Isaiah, wouldn't he? And as a leader in the first century, he's giving you a really big indication on what envy is doing to relationships. It doesn't take very long. For envy and self-seeking or ambition, confusion comes in. So some of these doctrines coming out against the Jewish people and even those who are believers in Yeshua, whatever label someone wants to call themselves, a follower, a believer, a Christian, whatever it is, how much division and envy is there even among them? We wouldn't have as many denominations, right? I I wouldn't think. (laughs) But here we are. We see this very well. And I believe here Rock City they're doing everything they can to undo these things, which is why it's a safe place to discuss this and pray for healing. And some of us who may be in, in a place where we're examining these things, maybe there are relationships that you have uh, examined, and you go, you know what, there's probably an area that I need to look at, right? And that's why we're here. And that's why the feasts are designed, to help us see these things, especially during the Feast of Tabernacles. Because I'll submit to you that during this time, as much as it is a feast of joy, there are times when it's some you know, being together for seven days with people you may not see but once a year may be a little challenging. And personalities come out. <laughs> Preferences and personalities and things of, that may not quite go over well. After one or two days, everything's good. After five days, it's like, okay, well, okay. You may, may get a little bit annoyed with each other. But if we're looking at these things and we're really adhering to what Scripture says, and we're, we're really seeking to make peace. Here's the wisdom here that, that James is giving. For he who makes peace. So here in Galatians 5, there's some pretty heavy content here about the works of the flesh. And there's no other way to really describe this other than as it's written here. It's quite beautifully put. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not uh, do the things uh, that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under that law. Okay? You're not under that um, consequence of the law for carrying those things out. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. And these things, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have warned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, here's the counterstrike, I'm going to submit to you, this is the opposites here. The fruits of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There is no consequence against those things. For those... um, Now those who belong to Messiah Yeshua have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Okay? So if we're not going to be in this place of the fruits of the Spirit, you know that there's the fruits, the works of the flesh are manifest. So when we come together for these feasts, what do you think our Heavenly Father wants to prepare? Prepare our hearts for all this. So I associate envy and jealousy with the Feast of Sukkot, but the opposite will be the fruits of the Spirit. And like I've mentioned before in previous sessions, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are not virtues that you have to attain, that you have to work towards. That's a very Eastern uh, New Age philosophy that somehow you have to work towards these things. These are things that are already in you because you are in Messiah. These are things that you go to your Heavenly Father and you access because instead, for instance, I'm giving you an example and something that I've learned from my close friends and mentors in Israel, Ephraim and Ramona Frank, they talk about impatience. And so for those who manifest impatience, because we, we do it. We go through, whether it's a traffic stop, someone got in front of you in the grocery store, you know, it happens. So the key here is looking at if the framework of love in Corinthians 13, we know the famous Corinthians 13, love is what? Patient. It's the first thing. So if you're manifesting impatience, then we know that there is something that's going to affect your ability to walk in love. So if you recognize impatience is manifesting, then you have the opportunity to recognize and don't agree with it whatsoever and allow for something already in you, in Messiah, to manifest, which is patience, something you already have. So be encouraged by that, that we have already, or we have already overcome and that these things do not have to ensnare us. Now with fear, I associate with Shemedi Atzeret, the eighth day. Here's some scriptural references here to what I... I'm looking at the day of the great and terrible day, the great awesome day. It's kind of what uh, I've seen in Joel chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm for, uh, in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my maid, uh, men servants. And on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So there you have it. A reference to... This last great day, an awesome day for those who are in, felt in, uh, in, um, in covenant and not so great for those who are not, right? So let's talk a little bit about fear as we wind down here. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So for all the times... Because everyone struggles with some form of fear. <clears throat> if you look at what he did give you, just like the fruits of the Spirit, if he gave you power, love, and a sound mind, what happens when some of those things aren't in order? Let's go over to 1 John at the bottom there. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You see that? It's a reference to Shemani Atzeret, in direct relation to fear. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we, in this world, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involved, involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So here you have the opposite of understanding and dwelling 
in your Father's love and knowing that if you have any type of torment in your life, if fear has ensnared you in some way, in your mind, will, emotions, and memory, or even your own body, those who go through some severe fears and phobias of things, this is the first step. And these feasts, this last great day, this eighth day, is the last convocation, holy convocation, is where I've seen and been able to witness people really confronting these fears and really being healed of these things. It's designed for us to really reflect on this and to trust in Him. So this is Heaven's Counter-Strike. We come to the end of the course. We come to the end of this insight. So on the feast there, uh, on the left, we have the feast listed Passover, Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, Yom Trua, Yom Kippurim, Sukkot, Shemini Aseret. The area of sin associated unloving, rejection, bitterness, occultism, accusation, envy and jealousy, and fear. So the counter-strike, I'll submit to you, every time the enemy tries to come and disrupt things, to try to redefine who you are, and to try to take you to a place away from your Heavenly Father, away from others, and certainly turn you against yourself, we have the Father, Father's provision for each season and for each area of sin. So for Passover, we see the unloving spirit, the destroyer spirit, coming in trying to destroy and take out the birthright, the firstborn. And what the Father does is He provides His perfect love, His love that only His love can guide us through and redeem us. So at Passover, we see that redemption of the bride. And only the Father's love can do that. That's where we have our identity. Our identity is rooted in our Father's love. And without that identity, we don't know who we are. Therefore, we won't be coming out of any form of Egypt, any form of bondage. So first step, if someone does not know who their Father is, who their Heavenly Father has said they are, and has not truly embraced their Father's love, is a very challenging thing to overcome these areas of sin. Feast of Unleavened Bread, we see rejection manifesting. The Israelites leaving Egypt, we see the disciples witnessing Yeshua being executed, right? Rejection is manifesting all around. The Israelites are rejecting at Moses. You brought us out here to die. The disciples are denying him and hiding and rejecting at him. But in place of that, no matter if we manifest this rejection towards God's self and others, the Father's counter-strike is, is acceptance. He brings us back in. He's accepted us. He loved us first, and He's accepting us. And just like He did, He had to take all of this on. When, he, when Yeshua died, all died. And He took all of that on in that very moment. The Feast of Shavuot, we see associated with bitterness, with the bitter waters, with the golden calf. We see the Feast of Weeks, when, and at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we see that those who were filled with, with the Holy Spirit and those who were witnessing were manifesting that bitterness, that mockery, that sarcasm. In place of bitterness, the first line of defense against bitterness is forgiveness. If you're not able to forgive, bitterness has lots of access and room to take up. And that's how we know when these things are manifesting. How is it that we get to seeing the Israelites come out of Egypt, come out and see all these miracles, manna from heaven, cloud by day, fire by night, provision, water, and they had the audacity to build a golden calf. How did that happen? Some form of unforgiveness was there and it gone to the place where they had no problems lashing out and speaking out against Moses. Even Moses' sister engaged in this bitterness. Interestingly enough, her name's Miriam, which means bitterness. But we see that these things are real, right? Yom Trua, the day of shouting. It's a day shrouded in obscurity, even today, as we learned in, during this course. It's not called Yom Trua today in the, in the modern world. It's called Rosh Hashanah, which was rebranded during a time when the Jewish people were exiled into Babylon. In Babylon, the land of confusion or occultism is where a lot of things were rebranded. 
That's where a lot of the Pharisaic Judaism came from. A lot of the Pharisaic thoughts came from. Right? We, we, as, we, as we see what Yeshua was battling in the first century, it was not against flesh and blood, and it wasn't against the Jewish people. It was against those principalities that were entangled with confusion, with occultism. They had adopted all sorts of practices that were not biblical. So as we see, even during this time, as we talked about, the fall seems to be, even in modern society, lots of occultic ritual and things that come along with the fall. And so now we see what's the counter the Father provides? His truth. Only He can establish truth. Because from His love, His acceptance, His forgiveness of our sins, does He establish His truth, the spirit of truth. As we, as we saw in Isaiah, that Yeshua taking on that office, establishing that truth in us. And now we have that truth in us. Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement, I associated it with accusation. We see that the enemy is accusing us, what, day and night? But we saw also in the book of Hebrews, as we read in this course, that he's standing in the gap for us. And he is in a place where he is redeeming us. And he is standing in the gap and redeeming us of our sins, even to this day. When we do sin, when we fall short of his glory, it's not our own righteousness that saves us, is it? And praise, praise be to Yehovah, our Heavenly Father, that things are not up to our, our, our own righteousness. That our, our Messiah is standing in the gap for us, still to this day. Sukkot, as we just learned, envy and jealousy. The counterstrike to it, it's real simple. It's trust and peace. If envy and jealousy is designed to get you to doubt your Heavenly Father, his provision, what he's going to do, what he's already promised he's going to do, what's already in you, trust becomes the biggest factor. And if you are invested in trusting in him and building your faith, because we know, as it's written very simply put, how do we build faith? By hearing and hearing by his word. So if you're invested in that and you're walking in that and you're making peace as it is written, this is where we offset and the counter-strike comes to where envy and jealousy does not overtake us. Shemani had said it, associated with fear. It goes back down to love. His fear has torment. But a perfect love casts out this fear. And we're able to also look at even more the depths of faith. So where we're now no longer looking at the things that have, we have grown afraid of from our childhood adolescence, adulthood, all kinds of different things that have probably come in through generational ties that we have. If we're walking in faith, or fa the word in Hebrew is emunah, which is also faith and faithfulness, it's, it's actually one word, we're able to overcome this fear in Yeshua. Not in our own ability, because if it was our, our own ability, if we were so good at it, we, none of us would have any fear, Right? We have so many people who are entangled or ensnared with different fears, who are physically sick because of these fears. But we know that this love that is only this love, it says it is the love that casts out this fear. It's a perfect love that casts out fear. And our human ability to love one another is not perfect. So this is where all of this comes together for the feast. So as you go from the spring to the fall, and you're able to go and examine these things for yourself, and you happen to look at the time and season that we're in now, how much more important it is it? Instead of looking at the details, for instance, in Romans 14, like I'll mention, it's not eating and drinking. It's not in the physical. There are those who keep the feast, and I'll be honest, in the last 17 years, you know, there's times where you go through the motions, okay, the next feast is coming up, and, and all of a sudden you, you, you seem to miss the purpose of it. You kind of, uh, like for instance, during Passover, you know, you're getting the meal ready, we're getting the lamb, the bitter herbs, and the moths, and along the way, even on the way to the store, he's showing me how I'm still engaging in some form of unloving spirit towards myself, being too self-critical, beating myself up over something, a mistake that I was making, and I'll stop and I'll, I'll go, you know what, yeah, this is it, this is the purpose of it. It's not about the eating and drinking, it's not about the meal, and you can get everything perfectly, it's not about that. It goes on and on especially when it comes time to receive the covenant, the Ten Commandments, as we see at Shavuot with bitterness. 
that this is, if you've got any unforgiveness or, or things, even right now in this moment, you can take that to your Heavenly Father and properly forgive those so that you can be released of that bondage of bitterness, right? So I'm going to close here with prayer. And I want everyone here who's attended, and if you've been watching online, you know, you can truly be encouraged by these things that no matter if the enemy has a plot to try to overtake us with these things or overtake your family members with these things, that there is hope and that the feasts are designed to prepare our hearts. Our, these feasts are designed to really get us to a place where we trust in our Heavenly Father's Word. We know what His written Word says. We know what our rights are. And we're able to walk in wholeness and spirit, soul, and body.